give some time for some testimonies. We had a wonderful testimony time in the first service and we want to give you just a little bit of time uh, to hear some of the uh, testimonies this morning as well because you are part of what happened. You are part of the prayer, uh, you're part of the work because you were praying. It was so busy there we had little time to pray. It was early morning to late night, early morning to late night. And so we want to, we'll give you more testimonies later, but we want to give you just a little bit, uh, just a touch of some testimonies this morning. So we just want to, wherever you are, just stand and don't tell me, because I've already heard it, turn around to everyone else and just give, give some brief testimonies this morning and I'll just open it up to anyone. Priscilla. Um, what an awesome God. Amen. God uh, was using us to do a great thing in the kingdom. So until now, I knew this is only one public school in China that led us to share sharing the Bible story. It's, uh, we are very peaceful. Yeah. God has the glory to God. Amen. 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 Truly, this was a miracle. This, this will be the only public school in China where something like this happened. We did use wisdom. God gave us, gave us this is how we say it. When I think no teacher said, I am going to teach you a story from the Bible. Um, we said, this is from the history of the Jewish people. And, but it's a true story. And uh, so we shared things like that. And then when we talked from the New Testament, instead of saying, Jesus did this, Jesus told this story, we said, the wisest teacher told this story. Of course, at some point in the week, some of the children said, we know who the wisest teacher is. It's Jesus, right? <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, in, in Beth's group, she, she gave the testimony in the first service. At, towards the end of the week, the students said, they said, but who? Who is the wisest teacher? And Beth finally told them, she, because they asked, she said, it's Jesus. And the children went, oh, because they'd heard of Jesus before. So their hearts were very, very open. So, but God gave us wisdom to share. And they heard 15 Bible stories. Really, we praise the Lord. Someone else this morning. Trevor. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, the last slide, Miss Michelle. Yeah, the last one. Right. Um, we had a wonderful time. We were able to pray for the love of God to come into the children's hearts. We, I can't tell you what the results of that will be today, but I want to show you Isabella here. We taught Isabella in 2009 in the first camp. So in a different school? Different school. She was eight. You're like, so I didn't recognize her. She's now 15. She is now a sister in the Lord. So if you wonder what are the results of this kind of a camp, this really encouraged me to see Sister Isabella there, a Christian girl helping us in this camp. And we had another one, didn't we? We had yeah. two Dayal. Dayal. Another one. from Dayal. that camp. And it just takes time. So it was a wonderful camp. Don't ask me how many people got converted in the camp. I don't know, but the seeds are sown. And you see the results here from Isabella. That's what I really wanted to say. And the other Amen. thing I wanted to say was, it was wonderful to have great preparation. We had the texts in advance that we could use, and that meant that Raina, whom Pastor Jennifer pointed out beforehand, was a spiritual partner. She was not just a translator. She'd read the text. We immediately started to talk about how do we do this, and that's wonderful, that preparation. So thank you, Lord, for all that. Amen. Amen. Someone else? Miss Helen. Uh, again, thank you, Lord, for what he's doing. Do you, I tell you what, Helen, come, would you come stand, sorry, to put you on the spot because Glenda's, Glenda's taping. Would you stand here and turn around? Here. Yeah. Um, again, thank you, Lord, for what he's doing, the doors he's opened um, in Sichuan. I'm going to get emotional because it's an emotional, obviously. <laughs> um, the children, um, their hearts are open because God's been working in their hearts for, you know, obviously and relationships as well over the time that we've been there as well. It's just been a very encouraging camp this time. And um, one of it, it's also with the um, younger children, we, we prayed together on one time because I was doing about Zaki 
and it's not working, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus. All oh, right then. We we prayed um, because it was a bit obvious, really. We we're doing about Zacchaeus one day, and it was my turn in my group to do it. So. God help me to share about Zacchaeus and also with the, my group, the other two groups in the younger class, we prayed together beforehand and God opened, I know that some of the children have, have written that they'd like to know the, the wise teacher, the wisest teacher. So um, just pray for them. You won't know who they are, but Priscilla's got the, their names, but just pray for those groups as well. All of the children really that have um, written their name on to want to know who he, him personally. So we had the, this amazing time of um, God doing his work. And, um, and you can see over the time of the whole of the Sichuan um, time that we've been there over seven years, the seventh year this year, how, how God is working in the children's hearts and also with the, the parents as well. They gave us their, their um, they cooked for us this year and served for us as well at lunchtime. So it's just, it's the Lord doing his work and um, help us all to just keep um, open to what he's doing and do it for, you know, not for him, but you know, he's the one doing it, not us. You know what I mean? We're his tools. So I don't know what else to say, really. But, you know. Anyone else? Who? Stephen, you, are you going to share something this week or your next week? You'll be in Uganda next week, right? Hey. Hello. Melrose, come ahead. Oh. Hello. I have a love. Oh, she does. She's been teaching at summer camp. Um, I would like to um, thank you all for praying for us. If not because uh. of your prayers, we won't be able to make it. Um, but the words that we are saying would just be words. Um, uh, my class, uh, Eagle, is the largest. Sorry. We are 24. Come here because we want to take it too. Yeah. Our class is, uh, you know, biggest and um, one of the toughest. They, we have on the second day, um, someone beat someone from our class. It was a big fight. No yeah. joke. It was a big yes. fight at yes. school. Yes. Yes. And there's um, this. Uh, like in the morning and also in the afternoon. That's why they were um, stopped or yeah, they asked them not to play games in the afternoon because they really were beating and um, someone really got hurt. And um, it was really um, a big surprise for me. And um, it was when we talked to them uh, the following day, they were really so apologetic of what they've done. And uh, me and my translator, we we're just, you know, crying. And um, we've told them how much we, how much God loves them. And um, like Beth said a while ago, that it's because of God's love that they are able to see the difference of um, a real love. It was, dis um, it was discipline with love, not just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And um, I really thought that they will not be able to make it. And at one point, um, because they know already the story, I asked them, they are the oldest one, grade six and grade five. And I asked them like, oh, could you, it was last year's camp story. And then they told me like the whole of it. And I was thinking like, okay, what else can I say? They <laughs> already um, told the story, but it was really God who, um, gave words to ask to you know um, to teach them and um, they have wonderful questions like who God is um, how would we know that he really is God and if Daniel has eternal life and we were able to explain to them and um, and it was really God who gives us wisdom on how to explain how big he is and that he was able to um, he gives us, uh, he tells us who he is with what we could understand. And um, at the end, when we asked them to, if they would want to accept the wise teacher, um, my class, they all said yes. And um, they said like, you know, um, we want the wise teacher to um, change us. We are lost sheep. 
um, and you know thank God for you know finding us and it was um, it was really um, because of your prayers and your love and you sending us we didn't just go there you went with us with your prayers yeah, that's right. and we just want to thank you for what you have done and um, glory to God for yeah. everything that he has done Uh, nothing really much uh, from me, but because I'll not be here next week, I thought I should say uh, a great thank you. Um, it can't be said in, uh, enough. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, I'm not a person who wakes up very early. Yeah, I struggle with that. Uh, but we had to wake up um, every day around 5 o'clock. Early. Sometimes 4.30. Early. And, uh, and then it's like one thing after another and rushing. Of course, Joshua and David are a bit slow sometimes. And, um, and then you've got school and you're lifting stuff and running up and down. And, and um, so I, 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 we can't say that enough. Thank you for your prayers. Um, I'm encouraged, uh, Trevor, you noted that. And I'm sure many of us know that. Um, Isabella and the other girl, what's her name again? Dayao. Uh, Dayao. Uh, she, oh, sweet girl, sweet, sweet sister in the Lord. Uh, and there were students in this camp. And who knows how many are there, because these are the ones we know about. The seed that we are planting is God's seed. The job is God's job. He will see it through. And um, I'm, you know, looking at them, you know, you begin at the first days, like, you know, they're jittery and not, not sure what you're going to say, who you are, uh, and you're teaching about love. And the next day they come and, and you, again, it's love, and you practice it, um, they see it in action. And by the third day, they are different kids. Um, and I don't think they can see the love that we have for each other, the teachers and the assistants okay. and the translators, and they stay the same. If you want to be hugged, if you miss a hug, go to Sichuan for the next summer camp. They will hug you because they miss it. And the first day is like, oh, you know, but the third day they're, you know, everyone, each one of them, boys and girls, and uh, they were, when we said, okay, today, this morning is the uh, last day, some of them began tearing up and say, are you going to come next year? And, um, and so they're looking forward to next year already. So God is doing a great, uh, uh, if you have been in China, you know, you know, um, or we are in Hong Kong, we know that this is a great opportunity. And uh, we thank God for it, and I really bless God for enabling me to be part of it. Uh, my kids, your kids as well, um, I mean, they, they, you reach a time when you feel God tells you, pray. And so we say, now we're going to pray. Close your eyes and you pray. Um, we do not want to break the law, uh, but God is above every law that is written by man and woman. And so we, we really, really saw the hand of God. And thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Not in every class, but in many of the classes, we gave the ch children a chance to respond. And we'll let you know more later. Uh, you can turn that back down now. Thanks. Um, and let me just read some of them to you. These are from, from the various classes. I want to be a friend with God. Love and change me, wise teacher. I feel that the wise teacher is kind and wise. I want to be friends with him. Love me and change me, wise teacher. Wise teacher, your love is so great. You are unselfish. We all love you. I want to be like you. Yes. Wise teacher, I don't want to be the lost sheep. Please bring me back home. Dear great Jesus, greetings. Thank you for coming. I'm thankful to you. 
Wise teacher, you are wisdom whom I admire. I want to learn from you. Amen. These are just some of them. There are more, and we'll let you know more later. And I'll tell you more in our class, too. There were good things. All of the kids were naughty sometimes, but God really moved and really worked. Um, I, I, I will go ahead and tell you this. In, in, uh, in one of our classes, I think it was the second class, as I was leading them in prayer, uh, I didn't say, let's pray. I said, now we're going to talk to the wise teacher or to the one true God. And I want you to, let's close our eyes. And all of the children, they closed their eyes. Some of them put their hands, off, their heads down on the desk. You could tell from their faces that they were quite emotional. And um, in that one class, for me, when we prayed, I, I didn't do it with any of the other classes, but I really felt an, uh, a touch from the Holy Spirit to say to them, if you believe and you, and, you, and you talk to Him right now, and if you ask Him, His love will fill your heart right now, and you will know it, and you will feel His love. And it was very, very specific, and I knew God told me to, to say that. And so we began to pray, and they began to talk. They were so still and quiet, even the really naughty ones, because I had some pretty naughty ones in, in one of the classes. They were wiggling, they were jumping up and down. I mean, really, it was good for me to learn patience as well. And, um, but they were so still, they were so quiet, and, it was, and then at the very end, they didn't open their eyes, and I said, you can open your eyes now, and they all opened their eyes, and it was still, it was just very, it was a very special time, and in that class, I'll show you the pictures later, you know, I'm not weird about things like this, but as we finished praying, our windows were open, a pigeon flew to our window and sat on the edge of the window, and we really felt that it was a sign from the Lord, we really did, and the pigeon, we thought it was a dove at first, but it was a pigeon, and then I said, children, look. And all of the children turned to look. And you know, this was a, a pretty noisy class. And all of the children went, oh, like this. And the bird stayed on the window, sitting there for the, for the rest of the class, for almost half an hour. Just sat there as the kids did things. And all the children were just, oh. And we didn't say that much more to the children. But the group leader in, our, in that class was not a Christian. Uh, she was a great group leader. She w did not know God, but she's heard the gospel. And my sister said to her, she said, you know, in the Bible, a dove, a bird like that, sometimes it's a symbol of God, the Holy Spirit. And when she, when Ellen, when Allah heard that, she looked and she went, oh, it's a symbol from God. And you could tell, it was, it was truly moving. And we really felt like it was a special touch from God at, um, at that moment. And God really touched her heart as well. So we really, we thank you so much for praying. And we know that God is continuing to do work. And if you run out of things to pray for, keep praying for the kids. Keep praying for the kids that God will continue to speak uh, to their hearts. In the time that we have this morning, we have more testimonies, we have more photos, but I want us to turn to the Word of the Lord this morning, and we're going to uh, turn to a passage that we know very well that fits with the testimonies that we've heard. And I'm going from the New Living Translation. This is from Matthew 9, 35 through 38. And uh, you know this passage so well. Let's read it. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask Him to send more workers into His fields. Amen. Amen. And I want us to look for just a few brief, uh, for a short time this morning, for about 28 minutes. 
um, at this passage. This is a passage you know very, very well. And the Lord put this on my heart early this week as I knew that we would be coming back from camp and sharing some testimonies. And I want us to look at this together and to allow the Holy Spirit to make some applications for each one of us. And there's much more here than we have time to look at. Jesus is traveling through the towns and villages of that area. If you read chapter 9, you will find out that the area is Galilee. So this is the home, the hometown, if you will, the home area of Jesus. And so there will be people, there were people there that knew him before he began preaching. There were people that knew him before he began healing the sick and casting out demons. They knew this, they knew this man called Jesus. They made no connection earlier that he was, that he was the Messiah, that he would, was going to work miracles. They just knew him as Jesus, the carpenter's son. Jesus, the son of Joseph, uh, who probably was a carpenter because he would have followed his father's profession, most likely, and Joseph was a carpenter as far as we know. But Jesus travels through that area and he's teaching in the synagogues. So he has to have some authority, doesn't he, to be able to teach in the synagogue. Not just anybody could teach in a synagogue. There was something about him that was different. There was something about him that had authority. To teach in a synagogue, you had to be very, very well trained. To teach in the synagogue, you had to have been trained by a rabbi. But this Jesus person, he was different. Jesus had not been trained by all the rabbis as he had grown up. There's no indication of that in the Word of God. But there was something different about him. And people didn't know what it was, but we do. And his disciples understood somewhat that this was the Messiah. This was the one sent from God. And remember earlier in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4, when Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has sent me to do this, 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 and this. All of these wonderful things. And that's what Jesus began to do. And He had an authority about Him that opened the doors to synagogues. Brothers and sisters, it does not matter your background. It does not matter your training, your earthly training. It does not matter um, rich or poor or any of these things. What matters is that you know God and you have been with Him. And when you have been with Him, then there will be a difference in your life and people will know it. It won't, they won't look at you and say, well, who are you? You're a nobody. But they will look at you because Jesus is in you. Jesus is in you. And so Jesus goes about. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's announcing the good news about the kingdom. Oh, and listen, it was good news indeed. Because up to that time, all that the people knew and all that they heard was, you've got to keep the law and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And the Pharisees and the religious teachers, instead of making things easier for the people, they made it worse. They made it harder. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Religion made by man will put a burden on people that is too heavy to bear, that is too hard to carry. And this morning, if you have a burden, if you feel like it is too hard, I can't please God. I can't, I'm not, I can't do enough to be good. I, God won't accept me because, because of this. And I haven't given enough uh, offerings to the church. And I haven't done this and I haven't done that. Then I want you to know something this morning. That is not from God. That's not how God is. Because the good news of the kingdom is that Jesus has come to set people free. The good news of the kingdom is, is that He lifts burdens off of people. The good news of the kingdom is, He sets those who have been bound and who are captive, He sets them free. He still does today what He did then. His power is the same. His work is the same. His love is the same. He's still working and walking through us and through the Holy Spirit in the earth today. He's the same Jesus. And that's the good news of of the kingdom. And that's what people need to hear. People do not need to hear from us, well, you must do this. Well, you must do that. We sometimes try to make people act good and act like Christians before they're Christians, before Jesus has come into their lives, before Jesus has come into their hearts, before the power of God has transformed their lives and set them free. Guess what? It's not possible. The law of the Old Testament couldn't do it. They couldn't keep the law. And we sometimes do the same thing to people today, don't we? We try to make them be good, make them be better. Only God can do that. 
Only God can do that. And so what do we do? We preach the good news of the kingdom. God loves you. He, ex he takes you where you are. He brings you into his kingdom. He will change your life. He will set you free. Are you bound by sin? God will set you free. God will deliver you. God will help you. God loves you. And when people hear that from us, and when people see that in, a, in, in our lives, then they hear the good news of the kingdom. And that's when a change comes. That's what we were doing in Citron this, this last week. That's what we were doing in sharing love and sharing these stories um, of, of the Bible. And so he preached, he announced the good news of the kingdom. And then what does it say here, still in verse 35? He healed what? every kind of disease and illness and I love that too he healed every kind of disease and every Ill illness do you ever limit God do you ever limit God no. there are things that are too hard for him sometimes thank you for saying no I appreciate that Colette no because we shouldn't limit God Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today forever and he healed every kind of disease Brothers and sisters, there's no limit on what God can do in our lives. We sometimes have really hard things, whether it's physical or spiritual or mental or emotional, and we feel like this part, uh, this is kind of impossible for God. This is too difficult, so we try to handle it ourselves. There's nothing too difficult for God. When Jesus walked this earth, he healed every kind of disease and illness. And then verse 36 tells us, when he saw the crowds, and I want us to see this this morning, when he saw the crowds, oh, I can only imagine what kind of crowds there were. Can you imagine? Now, there was no Viber, there was no WhatsApp, there was no texting, there was no uh, news on the television, there was no internet, none of that. But how many of you know that word of mouth is just about as fast? Yeah? Especially when you're in a, in a small town or in a village, right? You know? I've moved into uh, Kaolonghang, which is a very old Chinese village between Taipo and Fanling. And uh, Priscilla helped me, praise the Lord for Priscilla. <laughs> um, Priscilla helped me find a place, and, and I know God gave it to me. And uh, I moved in, and of course they all saw me move in, and I had a lot of stuff, and people helped me move in. And they all thought that was so strange that this single woman was moving into a village house so big and I had so much stuff and so one morning I was talking to an elderly Chinese man doing my best in Cantonese and and he said one person by yourself alone and and so I talked with him and I, I said yes but I hope that my family will come to visit maybe my sister maybe my parents will come to visit I'm hoping they will come to visit and then there will be room for, for them the very next morning, I'm going through the village, and I meet another, uh, it's the Lee village, Lee, uh, Lee village, and I met another Lee family member, somebody else, from, not even from the same household. And you know what they asked me? So, when are your mother and father coming to visit? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then when I came back from Sichuan, even Lei Sang, even my landlord, he said, so, and because my sister was visiting, he said, so, he said, when is it, when are your parents coming for a visit? So he'd already, pop, 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 he'd gotten the word as well. And, and honestly, word of mouth is just about as fast, isn't it? It's just, just about as fast as text. So you can imagine what it must have been like with Jesus. And, and it's, it's good sometimes to kind of, you know, to really think about the realities of it, just the practical nature. He saw the crowds. Why do you think there were crowds? He healed somebody that was lame. Remember that person that was, that was something that was really weird? If they were demon possessed, all those strange things that happened to them and they would shout out and they would this and that, he's okay now. And it's because of that Jesus. You can imagine how it spread. I can promise you that they knew, they had heard that Jesus had fed 5,000. He had taken just a little bit of bread and, and just a little bit of fish and he blessed it. And he'd fed 5,000. And I'll bet you in that crowd, there were people that were saying, is he going to feed me? Is he going to feed me? Surely there were. There would have been people in that crowd who had great needs. And they wanted to see Jesus. And they wanted Jesus to help them and touch them. But I, I love this part of it. It was a huge crowd. Had to have been a big crowd. And in that crowd, there would have really been mixed motives. Right? 
really mixed motives. Do you know, even in church so many times, very, very mixed motives, right? Sometimes people come with really pure hearts. They want God. Sometimes people come because they want a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I don't know. It's, you know. It's, is it true? It's true. Sometimes people come because maybe they want to get some money. Sometimes people come because their parents make them come. I, I know that's not true of Jeremiah and Sam. They're here because they want to be here. I, I know that. That's right. Thank you, Samuel. But you know, people come with all sorts of mixed motives. Or just, sometimes even it's just, I've come to church because if I don't come, the pastor will say, we missed you last week. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll come to church. We have such mixed motives. All people do. And whenever there's a crowd of people, you will find all sorts of people. Good, bad indifferent, all sorts of that. But what I love in this picture is this about Jesus. And Jesus wants us to be like Him. What does it say? When He saw the crowds, what? He had compassion on them. I don't know about you, but I know about me. And sometimes I don't have a lot of compassion for bad people. Do you know what I mean? I'm just being very honest with you. Or sometimes if I think like if a person is really, maybe I, I know that they're a cheat or I, I know that they're, they've come for the wrong motives. And I, I may be very, mm, I may feel this way about them because maybe their hearts really aren't very good and they don't want, they, they have other mixed motives. And I can be very hard and judgmental. But Jesus looked at the crowds, those same people, same type of people that we face, and it says He had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. Jesus didn't look at their motive. It, he, he, now, Jesus knew people's hearts, and he did. there was an evaluation of hearts. But Jesus looked at them, and He looked beyond motives. He looked beyond right or wrong. He looked beyond good or bad. And instead, He looked to their deepest need, their deepest need. And their deepest need was that they needed a shepherd. They needed a shepherd. And it says he had compassion because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he looked beyond the things that you and I often look at and he knew they need a shepherd and they don't have a shepherd. They don't have a shepherd. And he used, we have this figure of speech here because it was, um, it was a figure of speech that they would have understood. Now some of us are city folks and we've never been around sheep. Most of us maybe, right? Have you ever been around sheep very much? I know that Stephen has. Uh, okay, Helen has been and okay. Some of us have been around sheep. Not the smartest creatures on God's earth, are they? Not really. Not really. Not wise at all, really. And, but that's not the point that Jesus was making here. He says they were like sheep without a shepherd because they were confused and they were helpless. And you know what? That describes sheep without a shepherd. Sheep are helpless. Sheep generally, especially domestic, domesticated sheep, they are naturally defenseless. No big teeth. I don't know if anybody's ever suffered a terrible sheep bite before. I don't know. Maybe they can nip just a little bit or something like that, but you know. Um, but they are naturally defenseless, except for a few sheep, wild, wilder sheep or rams that have horns. Generally, sheep don't have horns. And generally, to my knowledge, there's no natural leader in a, in a flock of sheep unlike other animals, unlike other animals. And sheep without a shepherd are helpless and defenseless. They're easy prey for anything and any animal and for any danger. Sheep without a shepherd will lose their way. They don't know which way to go. They don't, they don't know the best path. And Jesus looked at this huge crowd and he said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Imagine how his heart moved because Jesus had already said, I am what? The good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. And I'm the good shepherd, why? Because I lay down my life for the sheep. It was a love that would sacrifice 
for the good of the sheep. And he saw this crowd, and he saw this people, and he knew they're sheep without a shepherd. And I've come to be the good shepherd, not a bad shepherd. Because you know what? In the world today, brothers and sisters, honestly speaking, in church circles, there are some pretty bad shepherds. There are. There are shepherds who, who take advantage of the sheep, the church members, if you will, for their own gain, for their own glory. They may take advantage of them financially. They may take advantage of them physically. They may, take, they, they may be abusive of power and authority in the church. That was certainly true in the day of Jesus with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And Jesus looked at them and he knew they need a good shepherd. And I'm that good shepherd. I'm that good shepherd. And his heart was moved with compassion. Now you heard Pastor Renee talk about this a few weeks ago. We talk about our hearts being moved, but remember what language they used in that day? It wasn't the heart that was moved. What was it? It was the bowels. That, and for them, that was the seat in those days, for the Greeks and the Romans as well, at, at this time, the bowels. This was the seat of feeling and emotion. And, and honestly, you know, we kind of think, huh? For the, for in that day, the heart had to do with the will and the thought. So in the Bible, when we read, love the Lord God with all your heart, that actually has to do with your will, with your choice, with every, every part of you. But this beautiful picture here of moved with compassion, honestly speaking, sometimes when your feelings are very, very stirred up, what part of your body is most affected? When your feelings are really stirred up, your stomach. Your stomach, right? It's true. Most of us, you know, you can have, you can, you're like, I'm not hungry. You can be so upset, I'm not hungry. You can be so frustrated about something that, that you have stomach issues or whatever. So that helps us to understand it a little bit. But here it says that he was moved with compassion as he saw the crowds. And when we look at this, it's another reminder of Jesus. Because how many people have you ever talked with? This is what Jesus was like. This is what God is like. How many of you have, have ever talked with people about God and they have a pro people have a problem with God? Yes or no? God is hard. Yeah? God is judgmental. God has too many rules. I can't meet the rules. I can't... Um, God is God. God judges people and He punishes people, and that's the image in the picture they have of God, brothers and sisters. That's the wrong image. Maybe that's your image. Maybe that's your picture of God. But understand something this morning: the picture that you and I should have of God is this picture, because Jesus came, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, with the full agreement of God the Son. They sent Him to this earth in a body just as you have and just as I have that, get, that got tired, that got weary, that needed to sleep and that he walked on this earth so that people would understand and people would see this is God. This is God, not somewhere far off, not someone who doesn't understand what we go through, but this is God, someone who understands, someone who speaks our language. Can you imagine that when you think about it in that way? The God of the universe, the God of heaven, the God of all eternity chose to come down and speak the language that you speak so you could understand Him. He didn't have to do that. He came down and limited Himself so that you could understand and speak the same language. And He would speak your language and you would understand this is what God is like. This is what God is like. And He saw them and He had compassion on them. All of them. He didn't say, oh, you're good and you're good, but you're bad. No. He saw them all and he had compassion. This is God. This is God. Good or bad, whatever they've done. He had compassion and he had love. They were sheep without a shepherd. And then he looked, he saw that. There's the first, there's the, the first figure of speech. And then he looked at his disciples and he spoke to them. And he said to them this. He said to his disciples. So he sees this. And then he says to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Now, think with me just a minute. He's just looked at the crowd. But then he turns to his disciples and he says, The harvest is great. The workers are few. He changes the figure of speech, doesn't he? Why? Because it's a farming community. And they would understand that as well. When we were in Sichuan, 
we could look all around us. The, the, it was a beautiful area. It's way out, 30 minutes outside of town in a really, really rural area. There are streams on the side of each road. It's a one-lane road to get all the way out to the school. And um, everybody's farming all along. They have big fields of rice everywhere. And when you get to the school and when you look around, everywhere you could see was rice and maybe, or barley maybe, right? Maybe not rice, maybe it was barley, it could have been either one. So these big grain crops all around the school. And then on either side, uh, in the waterways, they had all sorts of ducks. We almost ran over them several times. Because the big, the big bus would go down the one lane and the ducks would go waddling across the road and, and the bus drivers were driving pretty fast. And, and the ducks were sort of waddling, you know, they weren't going to move so quickly. And, but then beside the road, everywhere there was a little space of land, then they would plant squash, uh, they would plant other vegetables. It was, there was, it, uh, what, what else was it? Corn, there was some corn, there was uh, cabbage, all, all sorts of things, right? All along the roads. So they and we and the people to whom Jesus was speaking and his disciples would understand when Jesus said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. And so I want us to look at this as he changed, changes the figure of speech. And why does he do that? Because it's an agricultural community and they would understand. Now. He looks at his disciples and he says, the harvest is great and the workers are few. I want you to think with me for just a moment, those of you that uh, are around farms or have been around farms, what do we know about harvest time? Is harvest time a long time? No. Harvest time is a short time. Does harvest time, does it really matter when you harvest, as long as I get it within these few days, it will be okay. Is that, does, does that describe harvest time? No. Harvest time is very specific, isn't it? When it is ripe, it, whatever it is, when it is ripe, when it is mature, it must be harvested. That's the nature of harvest time. I told the first, in the, in the first service, my two cousins were all about the same age. Um, they are farmers. I mean, really, really farmers, farmers. Um, and sometimes in the summer, you, you can't tell it by looking at me now, but at harvest time, I've shared this with some of you before, I, my parents would send me down to my uncle's farm when they were still, we were all still young together, 13, 14 years old. Hard work never kills anybody. It's good for us. And you know what, parents? It's especially good for young people. It's really good for young people. And we would get up at four in the morning because it was the tomato harvest. And tomatoes, how many of you have harvested tomatoes before? Not just one or two from the vine, 40 acres. 40 acres of tomatoes and they all get ripe at the same time with literally within about four days within about four days we'd get out there four o'clock in the morning and you just start picking tomatoes and you pick as long as you can until the sun gets too hot then you've got to stop for a while and um, and then because because when the tomatoes are really hot you don't want to pile them up so you do it as long as you can till about 10 in the morning then you have to stop and then, in that in-between, then we would go over to the next field and we'd pick watermelon. Not the small little watermelon. Watermelon, this, no joke. Thompson Grays, watermelon that were this big. I thought I was going to die, but I didn't. It was good for me. We'd pick watermelon, and we'd pick watermelon through the hot part of the day. And then, late afternoon, we'd start picking tomatoes again. Why? Because when harvest time comes, it has to be picked. It has to be taken to market. It has to be done then. Because if it is not picked when it is mature, if it is not picked at harvest time, the fruit gets rotten. If it is not picked at harvest time, the grain will waste if the rain falls on it or other things. And so Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, the harvest is great. The workers are few. What does that mean to you and to me this morning? What, does that mean? what did that mean to his disciples then? Go ahead and find it and turn it off. Or if you can't find it, walk outside and find it. Okay. 
What does that mean to you and to me this morning? When it is harvest time, our priorities change. When it is harvest time, harvest is the first priority. When it is harvest time, if we don't invest prayer, if we don't invest finances, if we don't invest time, if we don't invest love in the harvest, then there will be those who will not make it. They won't make it. You say, oh, but Pastor Jennifer, God is a God of love. And, and there will be, be a chance in the future. It'll be okay. There'll be, there'll be another time. We don't know that. We don't know that. And I'm not trying to create a false sense of urgency, but brothers and sisters, I do want us to see and understand what Jesus said to his disciples then and what he says to us now. The harvest is great and the laborers are few. And then he says, so pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. That is amazing to me. Jesus was God. He could have done it by himself. But brothers and sisters, God has chosen always since Jesus came to this earth. God has chosen to partner with people, to partner with his disciples to do his work. He has chosen to do that. He has given us his Holy Spirit. And he says, you pray and you go and you give and we will make it happen together. And there will be a harvest. But it's not done by, it's not done by God himself and it cannot be done by we ourselves. It has to be a partnership. And that's why we said, please pray as we go. And as you prayed and as we went, God brought in a harvest. I can tell you right now, that there are children right here. You say, but they're just children. But they have a soul. They're just children they don't understand. They know enough to say, wise teacher, I want to be your friend. That's good enough for me. I think that's good enough for God. And they're part of the harvest. They're part of the harvest. And he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Jesus could have done it, but he didn't. He said, you pray. It's a partnership. And we do it together. And to whom does Jesus say it? He says it to his disciples. Who are disciples? Disciples are people who are learning about Jesus. Disciples are people who are following close to Jesus. Disciple is not an average churchgoer. Sorry, I don't want to offend anyone this morning, but a disciple is not just somebody who comes to church on Sundays. There are lots of people who come to church on Sundays. The disciple is someone who is close to Jesus, who walks close with Jesus, who's learning about Jesus, and who's close enough to Jesus and spending time with God so that God's love begins to fill our hearts. Who's with Jesus enough so that we begin to see what Jesus said. Jesus sees. Remember, they were with, the disciples were with Jesus, but they didn't yet see what he saw, did they? And then Jesus says to the disciples, look, the harvest is great and the workers are few. And when you and I become disciples of Jesus and his love starts filling our hearts and filling our lives, then he will say to you and he will say to me, the harvest is great. The workers are few. Pray. And we pray. And he sends us. And you say, I wasn't able to go this time, so that doesn't include me. Yes, it does. Did you pray? You're part of the harvest. Did you give? You're part of the harvest. Did you go? You're part of the harvest. Are you going to be praying now and in the days ahead for these children that said, I want to know the wise teacher? Then you're part of the workers of the harvest. That is what a disciple is. That's what a disciple is. We see what Jesus sees. We love as Jesus loves. We have the compassion that Jesus has. And we go into the fields, into the harvest, in partnership. And we go here in Hong Kong. We go in Singapore. We go in China. We go in the Philippines. We go in our families. We go in our places of work. We go on the MTR, in the marketplace, all of these places. You don't have to go to another country. These are the harvest fields here, around us. You see, it's what you can see. It's what you can see. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers. And if you will pray, he will send. And probably he'll send you. Because when you start praying, you know what happens? Your heart gets stirred. Your compassion grows. And you say, Lord, send me. And he will. And he does. Let's close in prayer this morning. Lord.
we want to be your disciples and we want to be close enough to you so that when you say the fields are white to harvest the harvest is great the workers are few oh Lord our hearts will be stirred and we will go beyond praying just for ourselves just for our own issues just for our loved ones just for the things that touch us personally and Lord we'll start praying for things that are beyond us things that are greater than we are things that move your heart and then begin to move our hearts Oh Lord we pray we thank you Lord that you have helped us to go into the harvest fields and to have a harvest in the Philippines and here in Hong Kong and in China but Lord we know that the harvest is still great Father, may each one of us call out to you and pray to the Lord of the harvest. May we have your compassion. May we have your love. May we have your eyes to see. And may we not be distracted or limited by any bondages or boundaries or barriers because you are the Lord of the harvest and these are your harvest fields they're your harvest fields because you died for them and you paid the price that they could be harvested and brought into your storehouse and brought into your kingdom oh Lord we pray to you we pray to you this morning oh Lord of the harvest Send forth workers into your fields, we pray. Send forth workers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Greet one another. Come back this afternoon at 3 o'clock and we'll have a good time together. God bless you.